everyone and welcome to it's all good all here <laughs> on rebellious ufology i am lynn hurley with my ever so charming co-host mr jim goodall how are you jim i'm here i'm delighted to be here uh, i just spent 10 wonderful days in minnesota mm -hmm. uh, that's why you know that's where all my family lives they you know, live in the twin cities nice and i, I and my my niece prosecuting attorney up in duluth so she oh, wow. yeah she's anti-gun, but she's been carrying a gun for about 10 years now. And she says, oh, this is cool. Uh, Uncle Jim and says, you should try it. And I said, oh, I do. <laughs> so well, then I, and I, I met with uh, uh, Jared uh, Murphy. We had a, uh, he was our guest here, what, three weeks ago? Yeah, I think Turns so. Turns out he, he's from Minnesota and from Minneapolis. And we have, we had so much in common. Uh, we met, say, five, uh, at least four different occasions over the last 10 days. Oh, working wow. on something with for, for South America. And it's just something that just uh, I have a real strong interest in. So it's going to be fun. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I went to the drag races. I haven't been to the drag races since the Winter National 1971. Wow. In a few years. <laughs> so and they, they had in a thousand feet these V8s that were de developed in the 19, early 1950s, Chrysler mm -hmm. Hemi. Zero to 331 miles an hour in 3.3 seconds. And that's in a thousand feet from a, from a wow. dead stop. That's and they're crazy. running, they're running nitromethane and it's, you know, those little V8 engines that get 250, 300 horsepower in a car, they get mm -hmm. 10,000 horsepower in a, in a double A fuel dragster. It's just amazing. Wow. Oh my gosh. So it was, it was just fun all the way around. I have, uh, I don't have any granddaughters. I have five grandsons. Mm -hmm. uh, aged uh, seven to twenty-eight. Wow! So yeah, they're my babies. Oh, Lulu doesn't know yep. what she wants to do. Oh, yeah, Scarlet. <laughs> Scarlet will probably be in here in a bit because oh. I decided not to close the door. Sometimes she'll oh. come in. Yeah, and she's oh, my good. she's my sweetie dog. Yeah, she's so cute. Yeah, for those who don't know, haven't seen her in the past. Yeah, you know, we have a rescue German Shepherd female. Uh, mm -hmm. Her name is Scarlett. She was a feral street dog for the first 14 months of her life. And she's, she doesn't, she doesn't know how to fetch. She doesn't know how to, and she doesn't come to her name. She doesn't respond to almost anything except for, huh. you want treatsies and her eyes get really <laughs> big. Oh yeah. They learned that one really easily. Oh yeah. They learned that wrong real well, but she's the most loving dog in the world. And it's just, um, she was real happy to see me come home last night. So. I mean, it was I just bet. wonderful. But oh. who's our guest tonight? I understand we it's Alien Girl. Amy. Yes, Amy, Alien Girl 111. Everybody oh, knows her. Everybody I... loves her. So why don't we go ahead and bring her on? Drag we her body in here. Yeah, see what we can do. <laughs> yep. All right. Here we go. Hey, Amy. Hey. You're good, muted good. still. Hi. What's up, Hi guys? Yeah. How's it How going? Yeah. Good. Everything's Thank good. Thank you come here tonight. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for coming. So, Jim, you may not know this, but Amy was actually at Dave and I's wedding. She oh. was one of the very few people there. I'll be darned. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, she was like, so, it really, so it really happened, huh? <laughs> uh-huh. I, I do. I have the video. I still oh, have good, the video. Good. I filmed it. Yeah. yeah I haven't I, edited it yet. That's 
Did I? I, I saw I saw a video posted on on Facebook here uh, in July that just did my heart good. Now, since the scandemic started, I've lost over 40 pounds. Oh, wow. And I saw a video of my ex-wife at her son's wedding, mm. and she's five foot tall. And the 40 pounds that I lost, I think she found, and it just did my heart good. <laughs> Take that, ex-wife. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the best, man. I love when that stuff, kind of stuff happens. It's the oh, yeah, best. That just, it's like the that best just... revenge, you know? Like, I'm looking hot. Like, yeah. I know what you mean. (laughs) So, and, uh, but it was, even, even my stepdaughter, she, I've only seen one post of her mother in, in 10 years. It's just from, from her daughter, but. Oh, wow. uh, Yeah. (laughs) But, so what are we going to talk about tonight? What are we going to talk about? Well, I know. What are we going to talk about? (laughs) <laughs> I want to I want to put Alien Girl in the driver's seat. What are we going to talk about? Yes, Alien okay. Girl? I just want to say hi, Jim. Yep. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to talk. I've met you before. Where? I met you at Disclosure Con 2021. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I came by your table and we talked a little bit. It was fun. Um, yeah, so I know, you know, I know what you know your work. I've seen you on multiple documentaries. Um, yeah. I saw you in rise of the tr3b right yep yeah uh, uh, cousins brothers stuff you know i think i probably saw you first on third phase with moon actually yeah but um you know that's where i get all my ufo news like that's where i siphon the majority of it and then i parse it out usually yeah. it's through third phase yeah. yeah that's where i get all my ufo knowledge yeah no i read um, uh, I, I i got a, i had a when i got home from minnesota yesterday you know last night I got a call from uh, the Cousin Brothers. He said, I just sent you a link. I said, went to my emails, and there it was. And it was the one hour and 47 minute documentary from the Cousin Brothers. And uh, and even and even says, uh, my name is the first name going, going up there. And it just, <laughs> how the hell did that happen? As and it should. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it's just you know it's the name of its uh, end game, and it's just. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, I heard about it. Yeah, when she said, I was like, "What?" And then I, yeah, I know it. Oh, yep, 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 yep. I'm excited. <laughs> it's all the deep black op stuff. Yeah, and the funny, the funny thing about <laughs> funny thing about all this, the funny thing about all this is uh, there were three primary people here: Michael Schratt, myself, mm. and. A guy who lives not more than maybe a thousand feet from me, and it's John DeSosa. Oh, John lives a thousand feet from me. Awesome. And, and he's been there as long as I have. Been I've, I've been here in uh, the Tucson area for ten years. Hmm. Was that that where the the boys filmed it in the cul-de-sac this last episode on Third Phase of Moon? Yeah, yeah that was that, that, <laughs> that was, was John's it. cul-de-sac. <laughs> John DeSosa. But you guys live like near each other in that area. I say about a thousand feet, as I can figure, 90 quarter of a mile. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Did you know John before you got into ufology? No, no, I, I knew I knew of him, but I had mm-hmm. never met him. Yeah. And when the cousin brother said, we're going to bring it over uh, John's place, and this was last summer. Mm hmm. And I said, "Does he live here? Or is he visiting?" He said, "No." He said, "He lives. He lives in Oro Valley." I said, "Well, I live in Oro Valley." <laughs> and when I finally, he and uh, Bella came uh, came over, and it's they say they've been they've lived there for ten years, and we've been in this house for ten years. So, it's and I, why I haven't run into him, you know, at the store, either Safeway or Fries or whatever, um, is just amazing. It is what it is, and it's just—it's fun having you know people with similar interests so close. Yeah. And Michael Michael Schrat has lived in, lived in the area a couple, two or three different times, uh, primarily because <laughs> I, I don't know—I I don't even know how to describe it other than the fact that um, Michael does what he does because of what I've done over the last fifty years. 
And he says, I'm trying, I'm trying, he's, I'm trying to do what, what Jim Goodall do, did back in the, you know, the seventies, eighties and nineties. And, and he's doing it. So I just, I can't say enough good about Michael and his research. And there, uh, and he just, he just had access to John Lear's stuff. And because uh, Allison Lear called me, which well, actually tracked me down at uh, John's memorial service uh, earlier this year. And he said, who would you, who would you trust John's UFO stuff to be able to go through it? Not to take it, but to go, you know, to go through and make copies or whatever. I said, Michael Schratt. I said, I said, do you trust Michael? I said, I trust Michael with my life. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't think he would ever do anything uh, that would be negative towards me for any reason. So I just, and he went there last weekend, uh, Ali Lear picked him up. They went to the storage facility and he spent all day in there and it really turned out nice. Yeah. Uh, the stratosphere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Does he know about it? <laughs> I think we told him last. Oh, oh. well, we told him about the stratosphere. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. That's you never know. Cool. Chris might make something up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She'll make so it it's, up. have it for yeah. sale. So that that that, that was yeah, that was a lot of fun, and I uh, I'm glad I went by and saw Lear last November, uh, and he looked bad. I've known I know John almost I knew John almost fifty years, and I'm one of the, I'm. Like Ali said, he compartmentaled most of his friends. So if you were in one area, if you were in, um, you know, your uh, Air America type, when he, because he flew for Continental Air Service, that's one group. And then he has a UFO group. And then he has, a, you, know, you know, three or four other areas of interest. But I'm the, I'm, Ali said, I'm, you're, the, you're the only one who actually crossed over multiple things. That's, and that's why she asked me who would be the best person to go through John's stuff. And that's when I suggested Michael. So he's going to do well. So Michael's incredible. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, he's we creating an archive and records of things that people need to track that people don't track enough. That's mm -hmm. the thing is there isn't, there are enough people out there collecting the individual cases like he is. So yeah. He, has, he, has an, he has he has he has information. Well, let's put it that way. Have you ever seen his book? I mean, the one that's you know these are this thick. These are mm. he has over three hundred of them like that, and they they document. I mean, he has probably every significant UFO event in the last hundred years. I think he has information on, and he keeps getting more, and he keeps saying, "Well, what?" So what are you going to do with it? Make sure it's not destroyed. Make sure it's it's safe for posterity. And he doesn't. If he makes money on it, that's one thing. Uh, and he should, because he is so good at what he does. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I'm just. Yeah. You know, I'm. I don't know if the cousin brother is going to help him uh, become you know famous or uh, you know, anybody else out there. But he need he needs as much support as you can give him. Because mm -hmm. because of what he does, and he every weekend he's somewhere, and it's all out of his own pocket. He doesn't have any sponsors or or whatever. So, uh, it's I'd like to see him. I, I'd like to see him successful. Absolutely. As for as for me at my age, you know, I I don't I don't need fame and fortune. Um, I'm infamous enough as it is, and every fortune I've had, X Ys have taken it. So, <laughs> what, can <I> <laughs> what can I what can I say? But I but I'm rich. I'm I'm rich in in living in a beautiful place with you know with a wonderful wife, beautiful dog. I am very healthy, and but my biggest fear I'm going to live to be over a hundred. I wouldn't want to be a young person in today's world. It is getting way too ugly, mm. and and I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to, you know. See, I'm I'm just going to hide in the closet. No, I'm going to go out and be a pain in the ass to everybody still, <laughs> and I have been. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> good. Oh, <laughs> one, one one good example. 
and I didn't, I didn't even know they knew who I was. John, in 1996, John Lear and I are at the f- fence line of Tonopah Test Range. It's 11 o'clock at night. We're out there with night vision goggles. We're in our lawn chairs. And we th- see three armored personnel carriers coming towards us. One up from the south, one from the west, one from the east. Their lights are off. And there's also a vehicle coming down the public land side of the barbed wire fence. And I see these guys, so I stand up and yell real loud, hey, we're good guys, we're taxpayers. And all of a sudden, boom, we have floodlights on us and little red dots. I had three little red dots on my chest. I had three little red dots on his chest. The guy coming down the public land side comes around John's pickup truck, and he had an Area 51 visitor's pass in his window. So I'm sure that, <laughs> that had an effect. But he, he has his hand on his gun. He's in desert utilities. He said, you're in a restricted area. I'm ordering you to leave. And I said, sir, I don't know who you are, but this is public lands and we don't have to go anywhere. I don't need your permission. And said, yes, you do. So I pulled out the aeronautical map that issued by the federal government that lists the longitude and latitude of restricted area. And I said, if you go look at that, the base of that fence post down over there next to my friend, you'll see a USGS medallion. It gives the longitude and latitude to the second. We're in public lands and I could be here for 15 consecutive days without anyone's permission. Then he said, well, I need to see some ID. I said, who are you? I'm Captain so-and-so with ASI, which is Advanced Security Inc. So in my, in my normal charming way, I said, oh, you're a rent-a-cop. You don't have jurisdiction on this side of the fence. And you can just see his jaws just tighten up. <laughs> And uh, he, he started giving us a bunch of crap. And I finally said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. So he hands me his ASI, ASI badge. And I said, sir, that's not a valid form of ID. I need something issued by the state or federal government. And he's getting even more pissed. And uh, so he showed me his driver's license. I didn't have my reading glasses on and I uh, I walked away. And I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm using, seeing Crowley's uh, response yeah. here. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I, I, I was living in Minnesota at the time. I, I gave him my Minnesota driver's license. Lear pulled his uh, uh, ID out and handed it to the guy. He handed it to the guy on the south side of the fence. He goes over to probably the supervisor, turns on the interior light, and I hear, oh, shit, it's good all in Lear. The lights went <laughs> off, the red dots went away, and they dispersed. And I, we knew nothing was going to happen, but the, the, the two pains in the ass that the, there's – been uh, a pain in this, with the federal government for a long time uh, with John and myself. And uh, I, I, take a, I take a lot of pride in that. <laughs> you so. should. That's an awesome story <laughs> yeah. because it does come back to that. You can ask for the actual identification. You oh, know absolutely. what I mean? Absolutely. Because my sister, she used to like be on, when she was in college, right? She'd be on campus uh-huh. and uh, they'd party or whatever and get in trouble. And then she they start running, 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 right? From the security guards. And she'd tell her friends, they're not cops. They're not going to chase us past the boundaries of the college campus. <laughs> right? So they're like running, like all partying crazy. And they're, they're like, I don't know. And then sure enough, Security guards stop at the border of the college campus. So it's interesting. We don't think about like people's jurisdictions. We don't think about how the power and control is. And so it's interesting how you could be able to identify them, you know, so specific that that you really used their own game against them, you know, so that's what it's all about. Yeah, I just, um, I don't know. I was, I was asked by George Knapp to be a commentator, commentator during Storm Area 51, mm-hmm. back was it 19, 2019? I think yeah, Time 2019. I, yeah, and but I have a friend of mine who uh, he says everybody at Nellis that has an eagle or stars on their shoulder, I drink with. Good, and he got a call from a buddy of his and he said they, the word had just come down from the Pentagon. He wasn't sure if it was Secretary of Defense or if it was uh, Secretary of the Air Force or whomever. But he said, under no circumstances will the, the perimeter of Area 51 be breached, period. And they said, he, they typed out period. Uh, they had uh, assembled all the non-lethal crowd control equipment that they could they could muster 
And this is the uh, microwave and the brown sound. And the uh, and they were expecting there, there were two to five million people had indicated an interest in going there. And then they started debunking it and saying, no, it wasn't going to happen. But about 2,500 people showed up. And someone said, well, how in the heck are they going to stop 2 million people if they're going to run the, the, the fence line or run the, the gate? I said, dude, the first person up front, trust me, <laughs> everybody behind them will be heading the opposite direction. But what they had is the microwave, which will cause a burning sensation, which you, I mean, which is almost, you almost can't tolerate it. It's a, it can't, doesn't do any damage. And then they have the brown sound, extremely low frequency, I mean, cranked up to 12 on the Richter scale. And what it does when it hits you, your bowels empty out. And you're a pant, you know, if you have a pants full of poop, your level of enthusiasm is diminished significantly. <laughs> so, oh my God. And, I, would, and they, I think that would yeah, dampen anyone's spirits. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they, you know, they also, uh, the governor of Nevada, cont uh, alerted the Air National, I mean, the, the, the National Guard, because the security forces at Area 51, both Wackenhut and Air Force security, have no jurisdiction outside the fence line. So the only, the only people that could, could arrest anybody were the state patrol, the county sheriff, we're in, we're in, uh, in uh, Lincoln County, or is that Nike? I think it was, maybe it was Nike County, I don't know, yeah. one of them. And uh, and or uh, federal marshals, you know the cop the cops in Area 51 and Wackenut couldn't do a thing but but look at us and hit us with with uh, uh, radio frequency uh, to burn your you know, burn your skin and the and the um, uh, brown sound. So, but it was fun. I just uh, I went I went and talked to the security people and they had a compound right in the middle of uh, Tippecanoe Valley. So I pulled in there and I didn't look like a protester. So I was well received by the state patrol. I was talking to a state patrol captain I said, yeah, the word came down. I said, you know, they, they cannot penetrate and we will arrest anybody who does. Uh, and the, I think there's only two people and they weren't, uh, and they're were both in the Netherlands or from Germany. One of the two stepped over the line and that's all you have to do. And I've been in area 51. I snuck in <laughs> years ago and I was, and I didn't see anything. I was so damn nervous. I, you know, I, went, I probably lost 10 pounds worth of perspir perspiration because they're not going to shoot you. There's just too much involved if you shoot somebody, but they can make your life a living hell. So I decided uh, against it, but it's a fun place. I know there's stuff going on there now. I, my, I used to have cars that I could drive on, on back roads and stuff like that. I don't have that anymore. Uh, I have a plastic car. <laughs> It'll do 185, but it's, it's, not an, it's not an all terrain vehicle. <laughs> so, so. so what's fascinating to me, Jim, is that <clears throat> number one, um, you're, you're friends with John Lear as yeah. well as Bob, you know, as well as Bob Lazar. Watch out. That's, that's how I, that's, I met Bob Lazar through John Lear. I've known John Lear since about 73 or 74. And uh, I met uh, Bob Lazar while he was still interviewing for the job at S4. And recently I got an e I got a email, a strange email from uh, this one gentleman. He said, they're not there anymore, they moved. Didn't say what the subject was, didn't say what moved, whatever. So I, huh. I responded back, I said, are we are we talking about things that go bump in the night? And uh, he came came back. And he said they're not there anymore. They're in New Mexico. So I got I, I went, uh, uh, my mind just went blank. I get I get distracted. Sorry about that. Um, well, I'm in New Mexico, so I'll go yeah. track it down. Yeah. So yeah. So, so I I sent him an email back. I said. Is it in northern Mexico, New Mexico, and is it Dulce? And he's and he said he, he sent me an email back and said, "Here's my phone number, call me." <gasps> so 
um, I called I called him when I got off the airplane last night, and I I haven't had a chance today because I had to go through the one hour and forty seven minute brother you know, uh, cousin brothers documentary on Endgame, and I had to make notes and uh, tell him what I thought of of certain things. And so I had about twenty items that I uh, commented on, and the and there was only two screw ups. They had James C is my middle initial. They had to put a period, they had a comma. So I told them, that, you screwed up really big time and I'm, I'm gonna have you killed. And <laughs> they just laughed. But it was, it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be really, really good. Uh, Michael, you know, Michael is, uh, he, he's very photogenic. He knows his subject matter. And I, and I can, I can't say enough about Michael. He's just, he's just the absolute best. So. What's, where we go from here? Yeah, no, I love Michael Strat stuff. So, okay, so you you met Bob Lazar through John Lear, and I've had a lot of questions about trying to figure out just kind of how did the general public learn about Area Fifty One. This has been something that's interesting to me as I try to track it down. And from what I've heard, you know, a lot of people think Bob Lazar may have been the first time that they heard of Area Fifty One. Other people have said John Lear was reporting on it for a while before Bob Lazar came out or that there was discussion. There was also some civilians in the area knew a base was being built, right? That was Tony Park, test, that was Tony Park test Range. Area 51 has been around since 54 is when Tony Levere and Dorsey Cammer landed on Groom Dry Lake. Kelly Johnson, the founder of the Skunk Works, was looking for a remote place to flight test the U-2 spy plane. So they're looking around the desert southwest. They're looking in Arizona. They were looking in uh, Nevada and also areas in California. And when they flew and groomed Dry Lake, they flew back to Burbank. They, the next day, uh, Kelly got on the, on the airplane. They were in a, a twin beach. Uh, and they came back, landed on dry lake bed, and and Kelly Johnson says, "Oh, this will work. It's too remote. I mean, it's, you're surrounded on on the Nevada test site to the west. Uh, you're part of the you know the the Nellis Range, so it's already a restricted area. And uh, one thing led to another, and they ended up picking up Area 51. And and, and people say, "Well, how does it get the name Area 51?" It's the area on the fallout grid when they were doing above ground nuclear detonations. Uh, back in, I guess it was the early 90s, I was on a tour of the Nevada test site with Stu Brown from Popular Science, Warren James, who is a, oh, a truly rocket scientist. He's working for uh, McDonnell Douglas in uh, Seal Beach on the Delta program. And uh, Bill Sweetman, and Bill at the time was uh, still writing for Interavia. And then shortly thereafter, he went to work for Aviation Week. And we went to the Sedan Crater and went to a few other places. Very fascinating. I've been right in the middle of Yucca Flats and uh, Frenchman Flats and saw you know, all the, the, the houses that were still standing that were built specifically to see how they, well they would withstand a nuclear detonation. And I hear on the radio, it said, uh, Escort, this, this is security. I said, I understand you have a Jim Goodall there with you. <laughs> I, I said, yeah. I, that's what, that the escort says, yes. Yeah. said, we need you to take Mr. Goodall and his party and go into the, the command center for, for the, the Nevada test site to be indoors with no windows for the next hour, hour and a half. Something was flying, and they didn't want me to see it. So when we're in there, they, they have this big, huge map, and it starts with area one, and it goes up to area 299, and that's how they tr tracked the fallout. They had sensors in each, in all those locations that would determine if, you know, what kind of fallout they had, you know, what at what level, uh, how dangerous was it, and so on and so forth. So... The, the site right next to Area 51 is Area 50. The site on the other side is Area 52. So it's, but it's it's still a cool number. I mean, that's you know that's part that's primarily my email is Area 51 at. Um, so it's just uh, stuff like that is just fun. 
It's just fun. Yeah. And, and I have a picture of me standing next to the sedan crater. I mean, that was, that's a hole that's, that's quarter mile across and 400 feet deep. And it wasn't that big of a nuke. And it was uh, Operation Plowshare, I think it was. They were looking at possibly using uh, nuclear detonations to to create a path between the Caribbean and the Pacific uh, to circumvent the P Panama Canal because the, the bigger ships couldn't make it, th couldn't get through there. I mean, the aircraft carriers and other very very large cargo uh, ships could not in block they were back then. So uh, it was something they really looked at, and they realized, well, we just dumped twelve million cubic yards of radioactive dirt all over southern nevada most of most of uh, utah probably up into uh, wyoming and probably in northern new mexico as well so it was something that didn't happen but it was interesting to, you know to get a tour of the place and it's even more interesting when they pick on me it just cracks me up <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, so you're talking about Bob Lazar, and you were that you met him when he had his interview at S4. Like yeah. that's kind of you. Did he tell you anything about the job application process? No, no, I, I didn't. I thought maybe he was, you know, he's. Well, I've, I've said it before, and it's repeating the same old stuff, but I'll say it again: how I met Bob Lazar. We knew the F one seventeen was flying. They had announced existence in November of 88. This is the first week of January 89. And I'm, I'm up in Las Vegas. I'm uh, staying, I'm uh, visiting John Lear. And we decide we're going to go. He said, I know where the F 117s are flying out of. And it's, we, we're going to go on a road trip. So we jump on, you know, get in his car. We're heading up uh, US 95. We're just, a little bit north of Scotty's Junction, and an F-117 flies right across the road, about 1,500 feet, and about crashed the car. So we got to Tonopah. I got a real quick bite. Uh, then we had, then we headed out US-6, about 14 miles to a big, big blue sign with a nuclear weapon on top of it. it says Tonopah Test Range. You drive down there, 18 miles. You come to the the main gate. I mean, I'm, I'm retired military. I can get on non-restricted bases, but uh, Tonopon -ton test range is, is restricted. So we just drove along the fence line. And I looked, you know, and you can see the whole base. And anybody out there who wants to go look, overlook Tonopon test range, because they're flying spooky stuff out of there, uh, you can do it. There's nothing they can do. They can harass you. They can tell you to leave. And you can just go, <laughs> and you don't have to leave. So John and I, we, you know, uh, we drive down the, uh, about two miles down the fence line and you're looking down on the whole base. You can see all the hangars. They have about 60 hangars, 58 or 60 of them. The runway, uh, it's a south runway. And I look to the north and I see a, a black fuzzy ball way, way out there with a landing light on it and a little yellow, a whitish dot with the landing light. I figured that's the F-117 with a T-38 chase. And it was, and it's coming close to me and I'm shooting print film. I have an icon, I have, good, I have good, a good lens and I'm, uh, I have 36 exposures is all I have. This is before, this is way before digital. And this thing is coming closer and closer and it's filling up the viewfinder as I'm taking some pictures. And also I see the, the entire airplane and it was like I was a 10 year old boy seeing a naked woman for the first time. My whole body was just vibrating. So finished the whole roll. We jumped in a car. We headed back up the road. We went down to Warm Springs and head down. we headed down 375, uh, Nevada Highway 375, which is the extraterrestrial highway. And we had uh, a quick dinner at the Little Alien uh, when Joe Travis was still alive. Uh, Joe and Pat Travis are the owners there. But we didn't get to we didn't get to Las Vegas until after nine o'clock. And those who can remember who are old enough remember there were things called photo mats. Would you bring your photos? They're, they were taken over by coffee baristas now. And by the time we got to, back to Vegas, the uh, the photo mats were closed, which means I had to wait at least another day, maybe two, to get the uh, the photos. 
And it's a little bit after nine, we get to Lear's house and John says, well, I have a, a new friend just moved here from Albuquerque. He's interviewing for a job in the desert. I think, I think he'll like him. So knocking the door about 10 minutes later and John goes open the door and brings this young man into his study. And he introduces himself as Bob Lazar. He said, I'm a physicist. I was with Sandia and I uh, interviewed for a job out in the desert. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be doing, but it's, it's a fairly high level position. So, okay. So I told him what my dilemma was that I had this print film that I, that been exposed shooting in the F-117. I don't know if any of it's good. And he said, well, I have a, a C-41 processing unit at home. Let's go to my place. He left off, lived off to West Charleston at the time. And John was on the east side of town uh, near, near Nellis. So we jump in the car. We're about a block from Lear's place. And Lazar looks at me and says, you know, I feel sorry for that dumb son of a bitch in Lear. I said, what do you mean? I said, he's from this world famous aviation family. His dad brought Learjet to the world. And the son of a bitch believes in flying saucers and UFOs. How stupid is that? So I'm a nuclear physicist. If I can't prove it mathematically or touch it, it doesn't exist. And said, you couldn't put it, you couldn't put a gun to my head to convince me that UFOs were real. And uh, a year later or so, there's a silhouetted head named Jared, <coughs> altered his voice, being interviewed by George Knapp, talking about doing reverse engineering on alien scrap at a place called S3, S4. That was the same Bob Lazar that told me that you couldn't put a gun to his head to convince him that UFOs were real. The other event that proves to me that Lazar is real, I was in the Pentagon. I was activated for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I had Bob's W-2. I went, uh, I had a, one particular day, I had a couple hours to kill uh, the people I was supposed to interview. I'm a historian. I was an Air Force historian. And uh, so I'm, I, I have Lazar's W-2 and I take it out of my pocket and I'm looking for the Navy, the, the Department of Navy that, that issued his W-2. And it wasn't listed on the Pentagon uh, directory. So I, I, did, I, I think it was Naval Investigative Services or something along that, that line. It was, it was a open door type of office. So I wandered over there. I'm in uniform at the time. I was a tech sergeant in East 6. And I go and I, there's a young Lieutenant JG behind the desk. And I mean, the door was open. So it wasn't, I'm going into a classified area. And I, I, hand, him my, I hand him Lazar's W-2. And I said, sir, can you tell me where this Navy locate, where this Navy Department is located. He looks at it and says, excuse me for a second. He gets up and walks into the two stars office. Then there are 10 or 15 seconds, comes out and said, the Admiral will see you now. Now, those who have had, who are enlisted and have, have had dealings with Naval officers, the last person in the world that that two star general or Admiral wants to talk to is the enlisted Air Force puke, puke that be me. So I go in there, I give him a real sharp salute. And instead of saying at ease, he said parade rest. So I'm still standing there rigid. And he is holding up Lazar's W-2. And I said, I don't know where you got this. But if I ever see your face cross the threshold of my office ever again, you'll be the most sorry son of a bitch in NCO in the United States military. Do you understand me, Sergeant? I said, yes, sir. And with that, he put Lazar's W-2 into the shredder and said, you're dismissed. I did an about face and left. If Bob was not who he said he was, he would not have uh, had, the Admiral would not have had the response that he did. And it, the list goes on and on and on. So, and I, I was blessed by having uh, Ben Rich as a pen pal. We talked to each other once a quarter for 25 years. And the last thing he told me before he died, just 10 days before he died, and he told me, Jim, we have things out in the desert and he wasn't referring to Area 51. We have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. And I can comprehend a hell of a lot. And if you've seen movies like Star, Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. I said, you want to you expand upon that, Ben? Nope. It's a very typical Ben Rich. And he passed away about 10 days later. So 
if Ben Rich is is stating that we have the ability to take ET home that at UCLA, then why in the, why in the hell are hasn't that technology been used for the good of the general public? And I think one of the one of the reasons, and again, it's it's you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. If all of a sudden we have the ability to travel among the stars, we can we have pretty much pollution-free, unlimited energy. Who's it going to affect? Oh, oil and gas, coal, nuclear. Uh, you wouldn't, yeah, and it would pr pr pretty much end poverty. And it's. Uh, Right. That's one of the huge arguments, right? Is that right. we're holding back a technology that could cure cancer, that could help us live longer, that could help, you know, all sorts of children maybe suffering with things. Well, like yeah. these are not good things. If they if we have this technology, they should give it us, they give it up. And and if when you if, when you use this as a uh, qualifier, no no business is going to offer up a solution to that re would result in their demise. So I'm sure the oil and gas or the energy sector, primarily, the energy sector is, I mean, we're talking about trillions upon trillions of dollars. If all of a sudden we don't need oil, we don't need gas, we don't need coal, we don't need nuclear because of what T Nikola Tesla was, what, you know, was talking about back 100 years ago, and with the technology that we have today, that it's buried and buttoned up in, in ex Deep, deep black programs. Um, why? If we to cure cancer, you may, you imagine how many hospitals would shut down. If we were to be able to uh, cure uh, type one diabetes, or even you know type two, you can manage. But type one, my my stepdaughter is a brittle diabetic. I mean, uh, she, I think she had diagnosed when she was about nine. Uh, almost lost her twice because her electrolytes went down almost to zero and hit zero it's lights out yeah but she you know she had a an epiphany uh, the doctor up in on whidbey island where i lived sat down with her and talked with her for three hours brought in some specialists and all of a sudden her whole, whole attitude changed about herself about you know managing her health and uh, 15 years later she is one year to go to get her RN and she's going to specialize in pediatric diabetes. And I just love Yay, it to pieces. That's amazing. Um, that's a great story. And, and I call, and I, I've always called her the brat. She's always called me James. Yeah, but I've, anytime I send a, an email to her or put my, where she posts something on face, Facebook or whatever, I always sign it Y E S D, which stands for your evil stepdad. <laughs> And I just love her to pieces. And I just, awesome. I'm blessed that she's in my life. So, uh, uh, but it's, that's, uh, I'm very, very proud of doing that. But let's get back on track. We're talking about UFOs. We're talking about Bob Lazar. We're talking about Area 51. And, okay, I'm uh, glad you're still interested. Yeah, yeah. let's go back to Bob. Okay, I got a quick yeah. question about sure. Bob Lazar. Because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of struggle for people to believe the story. Um, and personally, for me, since you shared so much, I don't mind sharing. The story really hits and hones in on me with a lot of correlations that I've seen throughout ufology. Like, there are some things for me, I'm just like, that is right on the money. This definitely sounds like what I've learned and what I hear come out of the Bob Lazar story. I just think it's a gridlock with number one what we found out in 2019 when it came out and after everything else that came after it, like from it all, it, it all comes down to like the, the Bob Lazar story. You know, I, I feel like it's a house of cards. Right. And um, I just think it's really pertinent that people understand <clears throat> the importance of the story. And so for my question for you is what do you think it's going to take for people to believe Bob Lazar? Is, is that train over? Is it still possible? I mean, we got, I mean, I just feel like if I feel like it's important that people believe Bob Lazar right, so that right. they can kind of see how it's, it's congruent with the history of ufology. Bob told me face to face, he said, the biggest mistake I ever made in my life is going public. 
I felt that was the only way I could escape. And uh, you know, his wife his wife died under mysterious circumstances, and I don't know if anything was related, but he was he felt it was important that uh, that he he made this public. This is the most one of the most significant mm -hmm. events of of uh, the modern era. We have a craft or crafts because he said there were nine. In, at S4 in, in nine different bays and the doors were open up. You could, they, all the doors were open up in, interconnecting the, the hangar bays and he counted nine, including the sports model that he worked on. And he sat down with John Andrews from the tester uh, model company. They made scale model you know, aircraft cars and stuff. And they did a 148 scale Bob Lazar sports model that Bob sat down and worked very, very hard with John to, you know, to make sure it was as accurate as possible. And I, I don't, I don't think he, his hearts, I don't think is in it anymore because he is, they've done everything. And when I say they, the, the anti UFO or the anti Bob Lazar, uh, cabal have, uh, uh, has done everything he can to discredit him. And, and he said, I really, he really doesn't care. It's, it said it just it, it it's affected his entire life, but mm -hmm. it's it's something that um, he's he's just decided he was just going to live with it, and that's and that's why he didn't talk to anybody on you know on the tube for twenty five years until for and I think I think it was uh, George that convinced him to deal with uh, Jeremy, mm -hmm. but I they didn't. Yeah, I want this positive, so I won't. I won't say anything more about Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> and that, and I, I think he, re, I think he regrets making uh, making that uh, video of, of uh, you know, With suppose, Jeremy, so, yeah. yeah, because it wasn't about Bob. Bob was in it, but it was more about Jeremy than it was Bob. It's very artistic. It was a very artsy kind of yeah, avant garde, yeah. if you ask me. Yeah, 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 and. <laughs> I think the Bob Lazar story needs it needs somebody who who's not trying to sensationalize it, but someone who wants to report on it and develop a storyline around it and do it in the in, in the best possible light in the best possible way. Bob doesn't have to prove anything. He came out when his you know when it, when he felt his life was in danger, he'd lost his wife, and he felt that. This is wrong to keep this to keep it, uh, and I'm putting words in his mouth that he didn't necessarily said, mm -hmm. but I think he believed that you know this is too important for the world for the world not to know about it, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of the one of the reasons. Now, I I don't I, depends on weather and uh, depends on you know if the if the Earth is still standing at the end of September, uh, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go on a road trip and I'm going to go spend a couple of days with Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. And I know I was going to do that in, in, in April. I have a car that you can't, it's no good in snow. And I had to go through some areas where they were, they, there was snow and ice. I have tires that are 13 inches wide and they don't do good. They don't do really good in rain and they're, and they're <laughs> in, crazy in, in snow and ice. So, so I postponed mm -hmm. the trip, but I'm, but I'm going to be going. I'm going to be heading heading up to see him. Hopefully, in September, the end of September. That's going to yeah. be fun. And maybe if I'm there on a Monday, we can do a uh, a rebellious ufology in Bob Lazar's lab. Oh my God, that would be amazing. Uh, yes, yeah. Be. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> can I come? <laughs> With special guests, Neely and Hi. Hi. One -one. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm here. Hi. Come I mean. Here. I, I could probably I could probably get a, a twelve or fifteen person van and fill it up with people who want, wanted to come you know tag along. Oh my gosh, yes. And, oh, and if he if, and if he said if he said it was okay, I would I would do it. <laughs> uh, I'll go. I'm going. Yeah. yeah, I'm down. Yeah. yeah so uh, I've never shot an AK. Yeah. <laughs> no, fly Have out. you shot his AKs, Jim? Have you? Oh no, I got I, AKs I, with his car. Yeah, I never I never made it to Desert Blast because I was always busy. I was always I had work. 
for a living. <laughs> Plus, I lived in Minnesota. And because Desert Blast got so popular, he did. He had 13 years that every year he would go out to a dry lake bed. I think this is the one out of Apex, mm. right off of Interstate 15. And would blow, blow stuff up and, and uh, fire off homemade commercial grade fireworks. Now, I, I spent two days in his garage making commercial fireworks. I think the, anybody that lived in his neighborhood would have been appalled by the fact that he had a, a five, uh, five gallon uh, drum of hydrazine, which is almost nuclear. <laughs> And a um, and probably a thousand pounds of black powder in his garage, because we made. I'm I'm talking about we're, we're we're blowing up balls that are you know 12 inches across, and you you buy the you buy the ball. They're commercially available, and that's and that, that's how you make your big fireworks when you. And that's what he did. And he's Bob Lazar is a certified master fireworks designer and maker. Who knew? I want I a did. Bob Lazar firework. I did. But the the one the, the near the, the second to the last one, they were getting thousands of people showing up. So Bob was only going to make the announcement twenty four hours before the event. And he'd still get a thousand people there. But uh, I think it was the twelfth or the thirteenth anniversary or the thirteenth uh, Desert Blast that they took their five gallons of uh, hydrazine and. Uh, put some dynamite underneath it and blew it up in the, in the lake bed. And it was, it was huge, but probably the most telling thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it you just like sounds to, like boys with like, a bunch, yeah. like hey. a bunch of the kids with, know, right? with all their fire. It's just funny. People grow up and we really don't change, you know, no, it's true. We, I, you heard the Bob yeah. Lazar tapes. I remember I listened to all the Bob Lazar tapes that came out on third phase of moon, how they were talking about how, when he was younger, he was doing just funny. I'm just laughing. Cause like, as much as we try to, sometimes there's just some things you can't shake out. And that's so cool that he did. That. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. yeah. It's just, all but, of it's so cool. But but he's human his, too. He's a person, yeah. you know. It's but nice he had. That uh, of him. So he had an ATF guy, a friend of his, uh, came out uh, to Desert Blast, and they had a 32-gallon uh, cardboard barrel, and filled it up with fertilizer and diesel fuel. This was only one. This is on a dry lake bed. Now to preface why I'm saying this. I was in Yucca Flats where they de where they detonated hydrogen bombs, and there was there were there were cratered, but dry lake beds are almost uh, almost like steel. I mean, you they're hard as a rock, and it blew a five foot hole in this desert dry lake, and those and people that were a couple thousand feet away were knocked off their feet. That was one that was one barrel, not the. That I think they had eight or nine there at Oklahoma City. So That's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you too, Jim. So Epic made this comment, and I hadn't heard this before. Um, he was, it was when you were talking about Bob. Uh, one thing I found interesting is he said the wreckage he'd been working from, he was, uh, I guess, I think it means like, he was told to have been found near an ancient site. Uh, I haven't heard that. Do you, or maybe Amy, like, do you guys know what site it was? <clears throat> well, an archaeological site, because that's what they say in at least uh, Bob Lazar and the Flying Saucers. And I think I've heard it from a couple different places that the Flying Saucers, one of the nine, as mm -hmm. discussed, was from an archaeological dig. So maybe that's what they're talking about? Yeah, because because Bob, Bob said when he, when he first saw the sports model, and that's what he called it, it was, it was intact. It was complete. Mm -hmm. And it sort of had, you know, the, that electrical noise. Excuse yeah. me, the hum that you get, mm. you know, I guess the 60 cycle hum. And he, uh, it wasn't resting on anything. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't on a cradle, but it was off the, it was off the floor. And he said he wouldn't push down on it. And he said it, it went down maybe this much, but it, it, it went down, but it then it just came back up where it was. So, uh, you know, the, the, the craft that he said he was in, I mean, that he worked on could not have been a, a one that was totaled or cra or yeah. they found you know, pieces and parts of the, uh, 
Yeah, he had one. He had one other comment, and, I, and, I, and again, it just it was here, and all of a sudden it went poof, mm-hmm. which is typical. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I've I've killed a lot of brain cells in my life. <laughs> most most of them, most of them recently with the cousin brothers. So it's it's, we'll it's blame always it on a, them. I will blame in a better them, way. Yeah. Than yeah. Kill brain yeah. cells. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. oh, and Crowley has asked this a couple of times, so I want to ask. I I think it's a little maybe off topic, but uh, ask Jim about the apex area. I'm thinking M caves. Do you know anything about that? No, I mean, is is the apex area you're talking about, the one right off of uh, Interstate 15, just as, you, as, so. you're, as you're as you're going up uh, yeah. US, 90, you know, US 93. Uh, that's, that's about, where, you know, the dry lake bed that's across from the apex uh, site hmm. on the north side of... Uh, uh, US 93 is you know, where he used to blow things up. Oh, it's okay. now the whole the, the whole dry lake bed is a uh, is a solar farm. Yes. Yeah. So okay. the Kenny Beach M cave. No, uh, I have thing, west of the west of the. Yeah. Okay, I think he said okay. yes. You that was you were thinking of the right area. Okay. Interesting. Um. Oh, there was another thing. So you brought this up. I think it was when Tim Senor was on and Tim and I both kind of had a funny reaction because I have, I've heard you talk, tell the Bob Lazar, Bob Lazar story quite a few times, but this was a new little tidbit that you dropped. Um, and I think you'd mentioned it before, by the way you had said it, because I was like, what? Where he said that at one point you saw Bob showed you element 115. Yes. Along this. Yes. That's I mean, cool. he just said, and he pulled it out and I, and I, it was just an oh by the way when I was at his house, and this was the day he was processing my film, mm. or the evening. And I also saw a diploma, and I very very I, I my oldest and dearest former friend Ashley lives in New Zealand now. Um, his dad had a PhD from MIT, so I know, and I it was in their living room. I knew what I know what that one looked like, and Bob's diploma he on the wall and I didn't I just glanced at it okay and uh that was that his social security card uh and all everything related to be able to prove who he was disappeared his house was broken into while he was as s4 and his heart his home was sanitized the his w2 uh his social security number According to Social Security uh, Department, has never been. In. He does. He doesn't exist prior to 1989, according to the federal government. But yet, one of the things that George Knapp did, and I got to give George a lot of credit for this too. But one of the things that George Knapp did to prove or disprove that Bob was legitimate, he went to Albuquerque. He went to Sandia, where Bob worked, and he went to the uh, or maybe it was Los Alamos, one of the two. I'm I'm still rummy from my ten days on the road. So he went. He went to the. It had to be a Sandia. He, he went to the uh, non classified area, he, you know, the public access side. He found a a directory at Sandia Labs, pulled it out, flipping through. Got to L's, there's a Robert Lazar in the room that Bob said he was in, using the phone number he said that he was to his office or to his work area. And the two or three other guys that worked with him looked the names up, and those guys were associated with the same phone number and the same room number. So that right that right there, you couple, you couple the, re, the reaction I got from the two-star admiral, uh, the uh, you know the, the George's you know, finding finding the information on the uh, directory and the other thing that George found, Bob said he was written up in the local Sandia uh, newspaper. Said Sandia Sandia uh, physicist enjoys weekends by going three hundred miles an hour in a quarter mile. He had his jet car, and I've seen it. I mean, it's it had a uh, Lamborghini Countach fiberglass body and a jet engine in it. And here's a picture of Bob Lazar in the Sandia newspaper 
published by the people who work at Sandia. He's standing next to his drag his dragster, and it's Bob Lazar. It's nobody else. And that was these were in the archives. So yeah, Bob did work for Sandia. He also did work at at uh, for uh, Cal, at Caltech in Pasadena, and to do the job that he was, I think it was it was a, just a contract job that he, the work that he did there required at least a master's in physics. Now Bob Bob is one of the, you know one of the smartest people I've ever met. My dad had an IQ of almost 175, pushing 180. So I know what geniuses are like. A lot of them are antisocial slobs, but they have a they have a mind that is like a bear trap. They just I mean in a or gigantic vacuum cleaner. They're just sucking in information from every source they can to you know to answer questions they have in their head. You know, is can I do this? Is this real? Has this been done? Can this be done? So I uh, I know what I know dealing with with someone who's incredibly smart is all about. I, I had a dad like that. I have you know, a lot. I have a number of friends that uh, I know they're, um, you know, they're they're pushing IQs above 140, 180, you know, 150. So, and Bob is one of those people. He he has that air about him. He has. Uh, um, he just. I think it would it would be even with the government, and and you can see how competent our government is. Uh, I don't think they could. You know, they could create someone like Bob Lazar from nothing and develop this guy and uh, you know push him on the general public just to build up fear. I know one one of the things that uh, they're saying that the uh, the administration has been doing everything it could to to keep people fearful. You know, if, you know first it was COVID and then it was this and then and now it's monks and working. So you know the next big thing, maybe they're maybe they're going to surprise us with a made-up alien invasion. Now, back in the either either the very very late 1960s or early 1970s, there was a uh, a softbound uh, novel came out that my dad suggested I get in, and uh, read, and it was called Wild Card. It was by two British authors, and, I, and my dog ate it. That's the only book he ever ate, and I don't know why, but it was, I had a little miniature schnauzer, and he just chewed it all up. And I should have replaced it at the time because it was, it was so important, and it, 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 off, it offered an awful lot of insight into the UFO phenomena. And it was a, uh, you know, the, the, the crux of the story is the world is at each other's throats. Oh, much like we are today. And the one way to unify all the warring fractions and people who disagree on this planet is to, for us to have a common enemy. So uh, out of Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland and in labs at other places, they developed metallurgical structures that are, that are not known, have never existed here because they created them in a lab. They had a, a, a bio-agent that was initially was supposed to just render people unconscious. They were going to blow up an area in South Central LA, you know, the, the Compton Watts area. They felt it was a throwaway area. I mean, that was their opinion back then. Uh, and that the, this would unite the world together to, you know, to fight a common enemy, which would be an alien invasion. Well, it turned out that maybe, uh, they had looked in the future and, and talked with uh, with uh, Bill Gates and Soros and a few other people who want to reduce the population of the world to 500,000 because they ended up killing most of the people in the area. This this pathogen that went out was only supposed to render you unconscious and immobile for a short period of time just to scare the hell out of everybody when in fact it, it started dissolving everybody from the insides. And it was, and then the people in charge, and you can see Richard Nixon all over this thing, and you can see you can see Henry Kissinger's character all over this book. And in the end, they started uh, those in charge started killing everybody that was involved in developing the uh, 
either the or, uh, the organic materials or or the metal materials that were used in saying, hey, this this is from outer space. This, you know, we just been you know we we just had a UFO crash in Los Angeles, and it's killed a hundred thousand people, two hundred thousand people. So we are now at war with with an with a, an enemy that we can't see, that we can't fight. And we can't, she can't go, you know, go to their backyard and fight them. So, and that was a book. I mean, and I'm, I'm blessed with a real, real good memory. And that's one of, that's one of the problems I have is I have so many things that are going on all the time up here. If, if for one second I get distracted for a minute, I have about 20 things that are going through at the same time. <laughs> and I, you know, and I, and I, I, I can lose track easily, but this, the book, and I may, I may go try to search it out some more. Uh, on some antique book, uh, it's, you know, it's been fifty years since the, the book came out, and I, I think I think it would be important for 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 people to, to to go out and see if they can find it and and read it. And it there's just there's just so there's so much you can see an awful lot of of what's going on today in that book and where it's going to lead us. So. Anybody, anybody who has a book that came out in the early 70s or late 60s, it's called Wild Card. It's about a UFO crash in Southern California. If you have that, contact Lynn or contact me on, on Rebellious Ufology, because I would like to buy the book from you, because it's really worthwhile. Or if you can tell me who has one for sale. Mm -hmm. so, and what was the name of that book again? I'll put it in the chat. It's called Wild Card. Wild Card. Do you remember Two who was? Two authors, and they're British. That's all I know. Two, all right. Yeah. Um, so they were. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Steam Chain Mark had a quick question. Uh, does Jim know of anyone who's talked with Bob from Congress or their staffers? Uh, no, I because of Bob. Uh, oh crap! Uh, who's the Klansman from West Virginia? Uh, the senator. I can't remember his name right now, but his his chief of staff came to visit both John Andrews, not, not yeah, John Andrews and I in Las Vegas about some of the stuff that Bob had said, but he didn't speak to Bob that I know of. Now, again, I'm and I don't know if he'll be willing to do it, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to ask him when I if if I can get up there in September, I'm going to ask him if he would be willing to go on the air with us oh. and just answer, <laughs> answer, que answer questions. <laughs> oh my God. Do you know how many people would be here if that happened? They would oh. go nuts. We would break, Lynn would break the internet. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and that's Lynn yeah. Lazar. I'll come if I get invited. Sorry. You just threw I mean, it out there, I, man. I'm I have, on it. You want to hang I out have, with Lazar? Yeah. You meet Lazar. Lynn, get some AKs, get some fireworks going. I'm so down. Let's bring the Cousins Brothers. Let's bring yeah. them all. Ooh. Can you imagine? That would be a great time. Oh, my God. That would be like the best time well, ever. Well, you know, it was, it was really funny. <laughs> speaking, speaking of the Cousin Brothers, I'm I'm up helping Doc Skinner move. Oh, yeah. It's 2009. He, moved, he bought a house, moving into the house. And he couldn't find anybody. Uh, everybody up there in Sholo, for whatever reason, the last minute, bailed out. So I went up there to help him, and he was on the he was on the speaker phone to the cousin brothers, and he's right next to me, and they're talking back and forth. And I, I'm not sure if it was Blake or Brent uh, said, you know, there's there's there's, there's this guy in, in Arizona somewhere. I've never really looked for him, but he's a friend of Lazar's, and his name's Jim Goodall. Do you know how to get hold of him? And Doc said, well, he's about three feet from me. Why? And this is this is the this is the week that Tucker Carlson and the Navy and the government person came out and said there are craft not of this earth over flying our military installations. Oh. Wanted to get wanted to get. Uh, hey, look who's oh, here. third go. Hey, hey boys. Hi, we're just yeah. talking about you. Oh, yeah, hey, yeah. their ears must have been burning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and, awesome. And she said, and they, they said, "Hey, would you would you call him up and ask him what he what he thought?" And I said, "Sure." So I have I both his number and I have his wife's number. So I called up his wife and uh, Joy answered, and she was, "Jam said, when are you come and visit us?" I said, "Well, one of these days, but uh, 
Uh, I would love to, because they had just moved from where they were to a new location. And I'm not going to say where. And uh, I said, is Bob available? I said, well, he's in the lab. I'll so, but a few seconds later, Bob's on the phone and you, you know, he has a voice and you can't. I mean, that's very, very distinct. <laughs> and I said, hey, Bob, he said, I got a question. And he said, I'm, and I'm taping this if, if it's okay. And you didn't have any objection. I said, would... Uh, my mind just went totally blank. Okay, I got it. Back. Did it. Yeah, no, no, it was, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a cousin brother. So I said, I got a question. I said, um, would you, would you be willing to comment on the report from Tucker Carlson and this other government uh, agent? And he said, he said, yeah. I said when I when I first when I first heard it, I just uh, I couldn't believe my ears. And I got all excited, but then I thought for a second, now wait, they wouldn't do something like this. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop and it's never dropped. And then they, then they bring it, they bring on these two idiots. This one guy, assistant deputy director for, you know, for security, whatever it is. Uh, uh, the two idiots that were in, in June of this year, when this guy who's supposed to know our, you know, threats to our military, where he had absolutely no knowledge of UFOs shutting down uh, uh, Minuteman three sites out of Maelstrom Air Force Base in, in uh, Montana. I said, if it was me and, and someone way up the food chain, like the number three or number four guy at the agency he was at, if they'd have said that, I would have fired the son of a bitch for being stupid and making a, an asinine comment like that. If, if you are one of the key key people and they had two you know two people up there uh, that you you know it's it's your responsibility for disclosure of ufo activities per an agreement signed by and ordered by through executive order and you don't know that our we've had nuclear tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles shut down because of an alien spacecraft and you have no of it and your job is security and you're a blithering idiot and you should be fired and you should lose your pension. And in fact, we should just deport you to Cuba or some other, you know, some other rat hole to spend the rest of your life and then ban you from traveling anywhere so you can't come back. I mean, that is as bad as it comes when, when someone who's supposedly in a position of authority and supposed to have access to all this information and know what's happening comes in. Well, I never heard of it. Well, then you're incompetent. You're stupid yeah. and you should be fired. You should be terminated. <laughs> Plain and simple. Gosh. I so there. don't know what's going but, on. But he's, you know, he's, he, he, did, he did say he gave me the okay. And I actually got an email that. And I emailed it to the brothers. And uh, they used that small piece. Uh, but I, 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 would, I would love it if I can get him on yeah. our program yeah. uh, and we'd have to make we'd have to make some announcements way ahead of time if he oh, agrees. If he agrees, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that that could really shoot the numbers up a whole lot. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Yeah. That would just be amazing to even talk with them. I yeah. just talk with them yeah. on the phone if nothing. <laughs> I mean, and it, right. That's what I say. And, and it it probably uh, couldn't be confined in our, our typical two hour window either. So. Yeah, it, it, could right. on, it could go on for a long even time. Even if it was ten minutes, and I got to say, "Hey, Bob." How's it going? <laughs> I'd be happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Just to, like, say hi to Bob Lazar. Right. Yes. Well, now yes. he owes he owes me a photograph. I sent my Blackbird oh. book and my seventy five years of the Lockheed Skunk Works book, and I I asked him said all I'm asking in return is a photograph of Bob holding both books up. Oh, that's awesome. And he, and he promised to do it, but he had the flu and he, I think he's forgotten. So I got to, I got to send an email and said, Hey, where's the, uh, where's the picture of you holding up my books? Well, he was, if you go visit was, him, I would I'll, like I'll, a picture of Jim Goodall and Bob Lazar sent to me. That would be pretty amazing. Well, that, that would be, that would be the main photo on my, on, on fake book. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you just text it to me, I'll be happy. I'll just, it would make my day. <laughs> okay. That would make my well, I will, I will get a picture of Bob and myself. I know that for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's not even in question, but. Uh, 
But oh, I would, I would. Can we get Bob to record an outgoing message from my voicemail? Like, hey, this is Bob oh Lazar. You gosh. reached Lynn's phone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I if I get him on, if I if if he's willing to go on uh, uh, on the air with us, you can you can ask him personally. <laughs> He'll be like, "Who is this idiot who got me to talk to Jim?" <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing the thing the thing about me asking Bob, I've never asked him for anything. Yeah, ever. I've never asked him for an interview. I, I mean, he told me, you know, he told me what he was doing, you know, from one friend to another, but I'm going to interview you. I've never done that. Mm -hmm. And when David Darlington came out with a book called the Dreamland uh, Chronicles, um, I'm featured in page, I, I featured in chapter five. It's called the elders and it. Uh, it covers both John Andrews from testers and yours truly. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, and I, and I, in writing, published, in, you know, for the whole world to see, I stand behind Bob Lazar. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And and the people are saying, "Well, he's he's a phony." How the hell do you know? Right. Where did you get your information? You just pull out of your butt and say, "Well, my brain, which is back here, saying, hey, that he couldn't <laughs> have said those things." Well, you can go kiss my butt. I mean, I just pe people who who. People just have a hard time believing sometimes, I think. But then they forget, you know, and I say this all the time. And I'm, Amy and I were just texting today. I was like, well, Bob is, a, you know, Bob's a person. And it's hard to know for sure unless you know him personally. You know him personally. Yep. So you have that perspective of Bob that, you know, so many of us don't. But he's a human being. So, and, you know. and if it, Yeah. And if it wasn't for the fact that the day I met him, Mm -hmm. said, you can put a gun to my head to convince me that UFOs were real. And he was ridiculing John Lear yeah. for, for being a UFO nut. So, so did Bob ever come up to you and say like, you know what? <laughs> I was wrong. Um, <laughs> let me tell you what's going no. on. Right. No? That was my next question no. <laughs> right there. I was, he never came because the, because he's saying he doesn't believe in the UFOs. He put a gun to his head. You know, he's like, I don't believe in them at all. Like, right. Put a gun to my head. And then he has that moment where he's like, Jim, what's up, dude. It's real. Like, what's that moment? Like, I mean, it, when, when I, when I first saw the, the very, very first uh, Bob Lazar interview that George did, um, Lear, Lear sent it to me. They said you said you know this guy, and it wasn't until uh, he actually made he went public that I realized it was Bob when they started using his real voice and then then his actual photo, or his image, not his photo, but his image. So, so I, I'm I'm hoping because of my 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 friendship with him that that. It, it, I mean, it's that's not a, it's not a, a a hard thing to you know to do if if he's willing to do it. I mean, right. all he has to, all he, it, and I'm a I was a salesman for uh, a long time. I'm retired military, but I'm also uh, I was a really good salesman. Mm -hmm. And if he said no, when a customer says no, when you're trying to sell them an idea or something that's when the selling begins. If they say, hey, yeah, no problem. You didn't sell a thing. They just, you told them what you're going to do. They agreed to it and boom, you're gone. If they said no, then and then you have to fight for it or, or try to work around it. Mm -hmm. And and Bob called me when, when John Lear passed away, his daughter Allison didn't know who to call. So she called Lazar, said, who should I, who should I call that knows my dad to, to, to to get the one, get the word out, and to and to give me, you know, I'm gonna need some help with his with his stuff. And Bob called me. He said, "I just gave your name to Allie Lear. Huh. Uh, John just passed away today, and uh, here's her phone number." And you know, I I called her up and we talked, and, and you know, I I put together a small little thing on uh, on John, and I did see him in November. And as far back as 2015, I don't know how he made it to 2022. Mm. He was in he was in such bad physical health wise shape. I mean, he was he as a commercial pilot, he he suffered forever with with really bad feet. He was in two plane crashes that I'm aware of when he was a young man, when he was in like 16 or 17. He was doing a, uh, some loops. He was in Switzerland, 
and he pancaked in. And literally, if this if this is his foot and this is the rudder pedal, he bent his feet all the way around where his toes almost touched his heels on both feet. So he, he shattered most of the bones in his feet. So for the rest of his life, you know, for you know, over 60 some odd years, uh, he, he was in incredible pain all the time. I, I, I flew in a jump seat on the L-1011 with him uh, going from Vegas to Minneapolis. And I could, I could tell as he's, as he's pushing the, you know, the rudder pedals, and these are just pedals, that I could, I could almost see him wince a little bit as he's pushing. It didn't affect his flying ability, but he was, uh, he was in bad shape. And, and because of that, he became immobile. And you know, he almost looked like, uh, oh, come on. I can't remember the guy's name. He was in Apocalypse Now, and then The Godfather. And I and I know the guy's name was right in front of my face when, oh, when he, is it Pacino? Pardon? No, it was it was no the old the old fat general. What was the name? He was in Apocalypse Now, and that was old he fat. won the Oscar for for The Godfather. Marlon Brando. Yeah, I don't know why he wouldn't his name couldn't come up, but in that when he's in this temple at near the end of the movie, I mean he's rotund. He's you know he's like. 400 pounds. And John had, uh, I mean, he was, I have a picture of him, but I, I, I won't, I won't share it because it's, it's so unflattering. And it hurt me that John, here's this dear friend of mine for most of my adult life. And he's in such bad physical shape that it, it, it pained me. And it didn't surprise me when I got a call from Bob saying that, that John had died and, and it was a blessing. He was in under so much pain. So, poor guy. Yeah, yeah. Where we? Where do we go from here, Amy? Yeah, I still have a ton of questions. I okay. still have a ton of questions, Mr. Goodall. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just, what you said, just handsome, handsome will do. Yeah, handsome. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just call him handsome. Okay, yeah. that's fine. So, or Mr. Yeah. Humble. Yeah, um, go on. <laughs> so, there's something that happens with the whole Bob Lazar story. And you're talking about Storm Area 51. It's always been in my own personal opinion that Storm Area 51 only happened because of the Bob Lazar and the Flying Saucer documentary. I think that happened in 2018. I don't think I know. Bob Lazar and the Flying Saucer documentary came out in 2018. That was huge. Everybody was all over it. Yeah. It hit the mainstream media. People were asking questions. People were suddenly like, what is going on? Because even though we all knew about the Bob Lazar story for the longest time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, because we're into it and we like UFOs and stuff like that. The general public really hadn't heard the story, right? And there's yep. one thing that comes out. For me, because 2019 comes out, you know, and then they have Storm Area 51. It just seems like an interesting, it's always been like a very interesting correlation to me. One that I strongly believe. I don't think the whole Storm Area, and for me, Storm Area 51 was like, but I would consider one of the first like secret protests for ufology for disclosure. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was just a bunch of people wearing alien masks, like break dancing by the area. Of it, but that was huge. That yeah. was a moment. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, and so bad that the military is like, we're going to shoot you if you come. And we're like, we're still going to break dance. And there were raves like, oh, I wish I had been there so bad. Well, anyway, you know, the yeah. point. Yeah. No, go, go ahead. I sure I do have a point. Sort yeah. of. No, go on. I'm... But the one thing that's really important that I think everybody says about the Bob Lazar story is you said it yourself, and I agree with this 100%. And it's that it's too important for the world to not know about. Yep. yep. Right. I agree. And, uh, and I think Bob felt the same way. This, this is earth shattering. Now, step back. I, I do a lot of different things. I've been around for a long time. One of the things I did, I did it because I, and I really enjoyed it, but I left because I don't, I didn't like the volunteer coordinator. I was a docent at Kitt Peak National Observatories outside of Tucson. They have 22 optical telescopes, uh, everything from a 12 inch to a uh, four meter, 13 foot primary mirror. And they have two radio telescopes, a 12, a 12 meter and a 25 meter. Just before I left, I, uh, they had all the astronomers, 
all the, the technicians and all the docents that you know, work up at Kitt Peak were all invited to, the, at, to their main headquarters at the University of Arizona. It's called the NOAO, the National Optical Astronomy Observatories, and the headquarters at, at the University of, of Arizona. And the person, the keynote speaker was one of the top uh, astronomers at, at the National Science Foundation. And he had just returned from a worldwide conference on exoplanets. And that's what, he, that's what the talk was about. And he said, this, he spent ten, the last 10 days at a conference on exoplanets and every astronomer and every uh, telescope location or operation, whatever it is, was represented it's from all over the world, from China, Russia, everywhere. And they were talking about, they're sharing their information. And based on proven mathematical formulas that have proven fairly accurate in the past, they calculate for every star in the universe, every star in the universe, there's one and a half planets. And out of that incredible number, there are over 2 billion, that's with a B, 2 billion Earth-like planets orbiting a similar sized brown dwarf star as our sun in the inhabitable zone with liquid water. And uh, the web just, uh, just today, uh, they posted a star system. I don't know where, I didn't read all the information because I was getting time to you know, come, on, you know, come on with Lynn. Shows planets. That's what's so incredible about the web tele space telescope. So out of, out of all the stars out there, they figured there's 2 billion Earths. And to quote Jody, Jody Foster's character in uh, Carl Sagan's uh, contact, mo movie and book Contact, if we're the only ones, what a waste of space. I've never felt we were alone, never since I was a little kid. I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever been abducted, even though I've gone out in the middle of Tipico Valley on a moonless night and say, okay, I'm here. If you can read my mind, take me. <laughs> Well, but Dolly and Preston, remember, yeah. they had a different thought on that. They were like pretty sure. Yeah, and, and let me bring my Nikon with me. Well, so I can, oh, so that's, I right. that's what I always say. I need <laughs> yeah. to be able to take my cell phone. They could totally take me, but I have to yeah. bring my cell yeah. phone. Yeah. I'm not going. <laughs> yeah. I get to bring my cell phone. I'm staying right here if they don't. I'm staying right here. Yeah. And I think what exactly what you're saying, like in terms of it being the most important history that humanity's ever, ever talked about, you know, um, and that's the thing is there's just so many things that that correlate with all the other history of ufology that almost falls gridlock into what happens with the Lazar story. That's why people can't shake it off. People yeah. can't shake it off as much as they try. That's why he always comes back up. That's why people always have more questions. And it seems like it just can't be exactly ignored. It cannot be ignored. And it's because there's so much truth there. Right. 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 I have, I have a friend, a friend of mine that uh, was a, was a KH 11 photo analyst. He also did uh, analyze imagery on U2 and SR 71s. And he was sent the original Polaroids, which you cannot cheat with a Polaroid. A Polaroid picture is exactly what the camera saw. You can't alter it. You can't change it. It's in the emulsion, period. And he had five images from Gulf Breeze that he did analysis on. And he said where the object was, how high it was, the way the lights were shining down at night, the way, shining down on the vehicles and other things, said there is absolutely no, and it made no noise, that's what the reports were. It was, you know, it was there was there was no noise, and this thing was just hovering over this uh, area in, called Gulf Breeze near Pensacola. He did all the analysis. He said it would be impossible to fake that. So that event, without from a certified strategic air command officer who went to school for a year to do photo analysis, uh, he said that is. That is a real UFO. And he was also one of the guys that uh, did the photo interpretation and analysis during the, during the blotched rescue houses of the Iranian, uh, uh, American embassy in, in Tehran, Iran. He, he had pictures of D Desert One where the, the C-130 apparently crashed into, a, a taxied into a helicopter. 
that was running. He said the imagery he said everything, everything the government told us was crap. Was he said, because if you look at the burn marks where the the uh, super, you know, the, the super sea stallion, the CH-53, uh, he said the seven bladed props uh, uh, ashes are evenly spaced like they're supposed to, which means the, they didn't, the, the engine wasn't, the engine wasn't, it wasn't running when the C-130 hit it or when it caught on fire. It may have been destroyed purposely. And so he's, you know, he's a known entity as far as, uh, as of his ability to look at photos and determine whether they are real or not. What, you know, he, he was looking at the light shadow, the distances, everything associated with it. And he scanned it, blew it all up, see if he can find the additional detail. Because Polaroids are historically very, very sharp. So, but Tom, you know, Tom said they, they, those, those, those images were real. So next question, Amy. <laughs> yeah, Jim's just like, bring it on. What do I got? What do I got? What do I got? What do I got? I got something. I got something. Okay. Um, so, okay. So your buddies with the czar, you guys like to hang out. You did make fireworks with him, which is pretty cool. Like my, yeah, my I, first, my first question about people who hang out with Balbazar is like, what do you do when you hang out with Balbazar? So that's, that's pretty solid. Um, yeah. And then also, you know, your meeting of him and you're hanging out and he talks about how, you know, he's, he doesn't believe in these UFOs at all. Um, and also just how intelligent he seems like he's just like naturally can just, take something and take it apart like it's it's in there you can already see it when when you look at footage of him and you see how he thinks uh i do so so i know george knapp and you are buddies yeah right yeah, yeah your I, friends so i mean you're aware that he was studying with like stanton friedman right yeah like 20, yeah. 30 years ago he was looking with Liz what did they yeah, i don't remember 30, exactly 30 or were, 40 30 or 40, 40 years ago 40, not 20 40. or 30. 20 years ago is 2001 or 2002. We're I know, talking about, I lose track of time. I don't, I don't me, even know. I, my, I lose my, so track of time. My, my brain is still in the late 80s, early 90s. And oh, for whatever yeah. reason, it's not moving. And when I'm not in the 21st century. That's but, good. That was smart yeah. of you. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good move for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't even remember what I was talking about, but something about we're talking about george knapp and uh, george Stanton. knapp yeah so george knapp and stanton friedman did some research together about bob lazar i thought did they i mean i mean yeah because of who bob is and where he came from and, and what he professed you know to do yeah i'm as skeptical skeptical as the next person but all you know literally all the evidence and I've been doing this, you know, since I met him. It's been, it's been over thirty-five years, thirty-four years. Um, you know, all the evidence leads to the fact that Bob is who he says he is. I mean, you can, there's there's just only there's only so many things. The, one of the other things, again, I got to give credit to George. He got hold of, uh, and also Michael Schratt, uh got hold of. Uh, the, uh, I guess the, the primary spokesperson for Dr. Edward Teller trying to, cause, cause it, he didn't interview with Teller. Teller told him to who to go interview with. So he, he went, I, I think his first interview interview was there at McCarran airport at EG and G, which is on the, I think on the South side of the airport. And uh, you know, he didn't know what he was going to be doing. And, it, and that's when I met him, but it was, but when, Edwards Teller uh, group was asked uh, about Bob Lazar and and, and you know, Dr. Teller, Dr. Teller telling him to actually, you know, he contact Teller contacted Lazar, told him contact so and so at EG and G. There's a position there for you. Um, if if Bob would have been a a fraud, they they would have said, hey. I don't know who this Bob Lazar is. He's a flake. He, you know, uh, he's, he's made up a story, and that's not the case. The case is the fact that 
Bob Lazar was employed by someone who had a W-2, and it's uh, and it was with a department of the Navy. It just there's just there's just too many things, and there's nothing that I've found other than people. Well, he's done. He's not who he says he he didn't go to MIT. Why did you go? Were you in class? You, were you in every class that he could possibly take to become a physicist? No, you're just blowing it out your butt because you you know you you want to be important or you you want to add something to the to the story, and you don't know. Yeah, all I know is from the day I met Bob Lazar to today. I believe him 100%. Hmm. When did that first conversation start with you and Bob when you like talked about what he was doing and, and the things that he was coming out with? Well, I mean, after, you know, after he had interviewed with uh, George Knapp mm -hmm. and uh, when his face was shown, then, you know, he would, he would come over to Lear's and we would sit and just, you know, shoot the bull. And he was, you know, and of course, John Andrews was almost, almost like my brother back then. I mean, we talked almost every day. And the funny thing about it, we'll get on the phone. This is before cell phones. So he would call because it was on Tester's nickel. And the first thing we say, uh, this is uh, Jim Goodall, a.k.a. Spy 2, talking to John Andrews, a.k.a. Spy 1, we're going to be talking about UFOs today. And we'd, we'd name off every classified code name program that we could think of. And then we go testing, one, two, three, testing, testing. Then we just start our conversation. We just, you know, we did that because uh, of events that happened with me, with John Andrews, that I knew they, they had to be monitoring something. I was on the road heading to Texas. John was on the road. He was heading to Texas. I didn't, I didn't know what his schedule was. He didn't know what mine was. And uh, he sent me, he sent me an email. I said, uh, uh, you, you know, I said, you know where I normally stay? Give me a buzz uh, tonight about 10 o'clock. So I did. And I was on the road and I'm calling, I'm using a, a hotel phone and I'm charging it to my room. I'm calling another hotel to where you know, John's room is. And about later, I get a I get a call from a, a, a Pete Ames. He was deputy director for program security for special projects, and he said, he "said It's been brought to my attention that you and your friend uh, are thinking about building a uh, styrofoam electric powered uh, sailplane with a camera in it." And you're going to overfly it over Area 51, and that's the discussion that John and I had. We were going to take a, a small electric motor with a good battery, wrap it in in uh, something that would uh, reduce the reflectivity. You can you can buy RAM. It's not military grade, but you can get radio absorption material. It's neoprene impregnated with iron particles, and it just absorbs the radiated energy. The airplane was going to be styrofoam. Styrofoam wing, you know, probably five, you know, you know uh, mylar uh, skin, and it'd be big enough to have a, a camera with a, a little motor that that would automatically just click after a certain time. It was time and distance, and we had sat down and talked about it for about ten or fifteen minutes. And a week later, I get a call saying, "Hey, you and your buddy better not do this because uh, there'll be, you know, there'll be consequences." How did they know I was going to do it if they weren't monitoring John's conversations or mine? But then again, Pete also told me, this again, Pete Ames, he said, don't give the lazy bastards more credit than they're worth. So when they go to a crash retrieval, and we're primarily talking about black airplanes, uh, not necessarily UFOs. He said, the people that, that, that are in the ground going through, sifting through the dirt, finding every shard and every piece of this, whatever the crash, crash was, those are usually the screw ups. Those are usually the flunkies. So... They're not going to do. They're not going to sanitize that place like it was you doing it. So he said, "Don't give them more credit than they're worth." So the uh, you know that that that's why you know a lot of the negativity associated around Bob it doesn't it doesn't hold water. It just doesn't hold water, and it it's something that well will we ever know? I don't know. I'm I'm hoping that something happens, and I just. In my gut, I have, I feel that there's there's something eminent soon. I don't know. I think even the cousin brothers mentioned uh, in their in our 
Endgame, their newest uh, documentary, of which I have a starring role. <laughs> and I'm just delighted. I just, I mean, it's it's just it's just fun. Uh, and I, and I, just, I just adore the Cousin Brothers. And they know their stuff. I mean, we, we, we did we did documentary. They, they'll, they'll sit down, do the filming 30 minutes after they're done. They have music behind it. It's been edited. You know, they put special events. I mean, it's, they're, they're really good. And they're, you know, they're, they're two hustlers. They're good hustlers, not bad hustlers. They're good hustlers. They, and they, they've been doing it for, you know, forever. They were pop, they were the kings of paparazzi for years in Hawaii. They had everybody on their payroll. You know, everybody, you know, any, any, someone would come in. They were the first ones there. They were at the private airfield when someone came in. They were there to photograph them. And they made a lot of money. And they they decided this is what they do. This is what they're really good at. And they are really good at it. And I'm just delighted that uh, our lives, you know, sort of intertwined. It's almost it's like fun. it was meant to be, though, right? Everything. I don't believe in. I don't believe in in uh, conse you know, not consequences. Uh, coincidence. Coincidence. You see, I'm still rummy from from my trip. I don't believe in coincidences. People come into your life. Jared came into my life, Murphy, for, for a specific reason, and and I was already. I already had my ticket to go back to Minnesota, and we sat down. And we've talked for hours and well, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn knows, you know, that Jared, Jared likes to that. talk. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we connect, we connected at, at so many levels and I'm, I'm going to be going to, if, if, I've already, I've already told the wife that uh, come this spring, I'm, I'm going to, you know, Peru on a geological adventure with mm -hmm. uh, Jared. And then nice. we're going to, and then we're going to, you know, I, I don't want. I don't want to give away what what he wants to do because I don't want anybody to step in into it beforehand. But what we're looking at could be the Rosetta Stone of uh, determining the age of uh, ancient structures. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. and I'm and, and it's really and you know, we got to we had to raise some money to do it you know, a significant mm -hmm. amount. Uh, the cousin cousin brothers are involved peripherally. Oh. They will they will support. Uh, our efforts one to raise money and to uh, raise awareness are we just are we just too disgusted for you now uh amy and you're going to leave us you just pulled your ear out <laughs> no no i had my family just checking on me because we thought oh, okay no, the just aliens. Wondering. they're used they're used yeah. to the aliens and the oh, okay. they just check yeah. on me once in a while yeah. like are yeah. you okay like, I, i've also i've also been known okay? i've also yeah i've also been known as a smart ass too so uh, that works <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. they've been hearing about the Lazar rant because I've been thinking about Lazar a lot. Like you talk about Quinky Dinks. Yeah. It no, like I, there, there, there isn't. I mean, I, I believe everything happens because it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. People come into your life and go out of your life because that was the master plan. And why am mm -hmm. I so bright? I'm going to turn that down. Because <laughs> you're just a shining star. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You make me make me sick over here. <laughs> That's why Jim loves me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Amy, you know, yeah, if we meet, you know, meet again in person, and Lynn, same with same with you, because I haven't I haven't been in human contact with Lynn, yeah, I know. but you and I met in, in nineteen at Disclosure Con. Yes, we um, did. You get to know me. People either really like me. Or they can't stand me. No one has a neutral opinion of Jim Goodall. <laughs> this is fine by me. Um, mm -hmm. It's because you're Goodall. It, all Goodall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I'm, I, I am, I'm thick-skinned. I, I don't, I don't, get, I don't get my feelings hurt very easily. Um, I've had my heart broken more times than I can count. But I've mm -hmm. also been, I've also been, been the, the heartbreaker I, too. I've been the breaker too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. My, my, my very best friend in the whole wide world, uh, his, his name's Rick, and uh, we, I call him RB. RB and I have been friends for 60 years, and he's been in my life through every heartbreak I've given or received. And uh, he was meant to be my friend. 
He went off to Alaska. I was stationed in Denver, and he was my roommate in Denver at Lowry Air Force Base. He went off to Alaska after the, the, the first year that I was there. And then he came back after a year, and he came into Denver, and I, he was you know, told me where he was going. And then I left. I went to Alaska, and I was up there for two and a half years. And when I got out, this is before Internet. This is 1966 is when I, when I got out. Um, I ended up in uh, Mexico for six weeks, went through about $4,000 worth of drugs. I mean, uh, food and booze. And, uh, <laughs> and ended up in L.A. broke. I was, you know, I, I found myself, I, I, I had uh, been drinking with some friends. I would fallen asleep in a park there in North Hollywood. And I just, uh, that's where my life was going. So I ended up going to work for the phone company. I'm, and I'm working in the Crenshaw district of L.A., and that's where the Rodney King riots were, and also the Watts riots. And I was a night repairman for the phone company. But our garage was attached to the uh, uh, AT&T, or Pacific Telephone School. They're, they call it the, the, the Stocker Garage or Stockton Garage. And I'm and the whole time I was working for the phone company, I had only been in the garage once for lunch. And they had a roach coach come in there and I'm walking up the roach coach and here walking down from the school is my buddy RB. I haven't seen him in three years. I had no idea where he was at. And I said, Oh God, where the hell did you come from? He said, well, I just, I just hired on with the uh, Pacific telephone. He said, I've been living in long beach for the last three years, four years. I said, uh, so where are you live now? I said, well, I just, I'm just moving into a place uh, this weekend on 102nd street in Inglewood. I said, I live in 102nd Street in Inglewood. So what's the address? He said, I think it was 4320. I said, I live at 4320. He moved in. Our front doors looked at each other. That's when I knew that Richard Lee Branham was going to be my friend for the rest of my life. And he has been my friend for over 60 years. So people, you know, when people are meant to be in your life, they will be in your life, plain and simple. And there's nothing you can nothing you can do about it. It just happens, and I, and I and I I believe everything has happened to me, and everything that's going to happen to you, the two of you are going to it, it's going to happen because it was it was already in the cards. So, I believe that. Yeah, I, I do too. I mean, there's too many too many a, a real good. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's you know, crazy. I mean, yeah, here's the brothers again. He's a thousand <laughs> feet from me. A thousand so feet crazy. from me. My Just God, a thousand you... feet. That's yeah. crazy. And I was really have like coffee with Jim D'Souza. I don't even drink coffee, but I'd go have it with him. Yeah, and and which is really funny. At there was there were at least three times when Michael Schratt was living in Oro Valley as well. Oh, really? Yeah. So the Just three of us. You knew him. No, I've known Michael for 25 years, oh, but okay. I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't know John lived here. Oh, uh, 25 and, you know, years. How old was he? Two when you met him? He was 25. Michael, he, was, he was 25 Michael's when you met him. Baby face. Yeah, he, oh, he is. He, he, so young and he is. He is as straight arrow as they come. That's he awesome. wouldn't. I don't think he knows. I don't think he could lie. And the thing I love about his presentations on you know known alien crashes and recovery is he doesn't inject his opinion in anything. He's like Joe Friday from Dragnet. These are the facts. We only use the facts. The names have been changed to protect the innocent and not necessarily that part, but he doesn't, he doesn't give his own opinion. He reports it as it was documented by authorities or, 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 uh, you know, people who, you know, people who saw it, you know, first person interviews, military uh, you know documents police documents fa documents and, and, and he puts that all in his book i mean he has mm -hmm. oh crap where in hell we go i can't find his book it was oh, right here oh. yeah Hold it is a, a great book it is a great book i definitely oh. recommend it anyone who hasn't had it or looked at it read it go buy yeah. it it's awesome it's worth it yeah it's um and he he has a, he has a website. I mean, a YouTube channel. It's Blue Room Media. If you like yeah. Michael Schratt, go to Blue Room Media. Yeah, 
And I like that he re- he he presents stories in a very relatable way. And the fact, and I've said this on here before, and to him, I love the fact that he gets the um, the renditions made, the pictures of them, because it just makes it so much more you know understandable and relatable. Like I was saying, when you see the pictures, because yeah. it just it puts a face yeah. to the story, really. It becomes real. Something, yeah. something you can hang your hat on. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, he is incredible. We all yes, love Michael. Yes, Gale. he is. Yeah, yes, he is. Okay, where else? What else? <clears throat> Let's see here. See, it's, it's, this, this um, is your. This is. I know. Come on, Amy. This is your chance. No, yo, this is my <laughs> chance. Yeah. Hey, what did the? They said they had no idea. They lived a thousand feet, feet away, away from, from each, each other. other. That's so crazy. Yeah. That's such a trip. Brothers Just that alone. Together. Yeah. Such yeah. a trip. And and again, the world is so weird. Yeah, and and again, me so connecting weird. with the cousin brothers. If I hadn't gone up to help Doc Skinner move, or if I'd gotten there a couple hours later, I wouldn't have been there when they had the conf- when they had the conversation. Right. So, so I was meant to uh, to bring the cousin brothers into my circle of influence, whatever you want to call it. Um, and and it, it, it all, it all came from there. I gotta, I gotta, here we it's go. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I love it. It's yeah. all really important, you know, like, <clears throat> and it's interesting because people talk about, you know, the false flag alien invasion. Um, and honestly, like it's something we should, think about all it would take for to scare people back into their houses is a flying saucer rolling around yeah and i and i and i agree with the brothers on that on their statement too i mean it's just Mm -hmm. if whomever from whatever worlds are coming from visiting the, the earth if they wanted to do a number on us all they'd have to do is push one button i'm sure I mean, you can't. No, kind of you, you can't. You can't go across the universe in a blink of an eye, and not have the ability to, you know, to squash this little blue marble that's over in this insignificant solar system in an insignificant galaxy, in an yeah. insignificant corner of the universe. Well, you make us sound so great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, sign we're, us up. We're, we'll go to Earth. <laughs> Where else can I can I can I be on a conversation with two good looking women? I don't know. <laughs> hey. it, it'd have to be it'd have to be Earth. It'd have to be Earth. That's right. Yeah. Earth yeah. girls are easy. I've heard that before. Oh yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. 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 That, yeah. <laughs> it, it was a silly movie too. Yeah. That was, That's it, a great with, movie, with Gina yeah. Davis and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But my favorite my favorite UFO uh movie is Coneheads. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's such oh a good God. one. I haven't seen I just, that in so long. I just, I just love their conversations. Their their conehead speak, yeah. if you want to call it that. And oh I mean, and they had the best comedians of them all. They had them all. This is before, uh, you know, before any of them left this, you know, left our planet. Yeah. And it was it's just it's just a it's a feel good, make you laugh. Wasn't Dan Aykroyd in that? Yes, he was. Yeah, he was Mr. He's a big he was UFO. he was Mr. Conehead. Jane Curtin and uh, yeah, that's uh, great. I, I mean, every everybody from Saturday night, the early Saturday Night Lives, and it's a great movie. And I, an epic. Uh, I, I agree hundred percent. It was a great movie, and I just I just love it. And I also like the other one with Dan Aykroyd, uh, John Levitt's. Uh, hmm. Oh shit! I can't I can't remember her name, but. Um, my mother, my stepmother's an alien. Kim Basinger was the, was the stepmother. Oh my gosh! Yes, I haven't seen that in so long. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. So those uh, th- those are just those are just two priceless uh, yeah. movies, and they're just they're just fun. But yeah. but it's a relatable subject. Yeah. Well, I like the fun movies, too, because I think they hide a lot in them. The other ones, you know, where, you know, the aliens are coming to take over the world and, and kill us all. Like, there's just, like, a fear factor in, the, in those that I'm not, like, crazy about. But, like, Coneheads, you are talking about. Or Men in Black. I love the Men in Black. Movies. Oh, yeah. They're great. And there's so much in them that you realize 
you have to you, you have to watch it four or five times and yeah. really pay attention mm -hmm. and look in the background yeah. and any anything produced anything that that uh, Dan Acker is part of, including the Blues Brothers. That's that's probably on the top of my list too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I I have a weird assortment of movies that I really really love. Blues Brothers is one. A Few Good Men is the other. I mean, you couldn't be more far apart as far as uh, subject matter. Of but Ackroyd does, and Ackroyd's a true believer. He's a, he's a he true believer in UFOs. Hasn't he had an experience? Yes, he's been he has, MIB, right? the MIB. Yeah, they were after him. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so yeah, that's amazing. I love he's when an these celebrities yeah. and 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 people are cut like famous people are coming out now. I mean, we have like even in sports, like it seems like a lot of people in the sports realm like are really getting into UFOs. But I mean, Aaron Rodgers, he's been talking about UFOs for his UFO experience for years, you mm -hmm. know, and we have, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe I don't remember his, his name. I'm so sorry, Dave Hurley, the lead singer of Van Halen, Sammy, Sammy Hagar. He's a believer in UFOs. Yeah. yeah. See, that's good. Yeah. That's good. He we had need an more. too. No, I, I just had I, I just had a, I just had a brilliant thought and it just went away. Damn. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't I don't hold you personally responsible, so it's okay. Yeah. Dan has a freaking database of UFOs, Crowley said. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm trying to remember what the heck I was just thinking, and and all of a sudden things got crossed. It'll come to me. It may be after we. Oh. We hang out. Oh, did I say Van Hagar? Oh my God! Thank you, Epic. Yes, Van Halen. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, terrible, yeah. terrible representation. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. <laughs> my musician husband. Oh. oh. Sorry. No, I didn't. I didn't realize until probably this uh, the, the second time you're on after you change your name that the music is coming better half. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my husband. <laughs> yeah. That, that's great. That's great. Oh. And, uh, okay. I mean, I see. There was, I had one. I had one other thing that I was gonna. I was gonna discuss, and I can't remember what the heck it was. So it, it was oh, probably. Well, it was probably a lie. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all a lie. That's it. That's yeah. all. That's all I got out of this, no. Jim. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. No, I, I'm. 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 I'm hoping. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to say to do do something with Lazar on this on this program if he'll agree. Yeah, and I. Yeah, yeah. I got a couple of people. So, well, going to someone that has a large audience, I said, "So we like, we have a nice size audience, and we need you know I want to help it help us grow. What mm -hmm. better way than to have someone at the level of Lazar on on board? Yeah. Plus, he would just yeah. be a really cool yeah. guy to talk to. I think. He's oh yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Oh, I know. I remember what I was going to say. Yeah, years ago, I I was on state staff with the Minnesota Guard, mm -hmm. and my my boss was Major General Wayne Gatlin. And Wayne's the reason I, I, I went back into the military. He's just, uh, he was, he was some, he was like a John Wayne type of guy. I mean, he just, he, everything he did was great. And I asked him, I said, uh, General Gatlin, I had a question. Let's assume for a moment I'm an F-4 pilot in the United States Air Force or the Air National Guard or the Naval Reserve or whatever. But in the military, I'm a pilot, and I encounter a UFO. I mean, I'm right up flying in formation with it. It's 100 feet from me. I have a really good description of what it looks like. And I, and it finally zips off, and I now I'm like, my training flight is over with. I'm heading back to base. I go in, I do my post-flight uh, checkout. What do I do next? He said, go to the club order a bunch of really, really stiff drinks, slam them down, leave, go to the BOQ, go to sleep and forget what you saw. Mm. They said, because, and this is the mid, this is the mid 1980s. He said, because if you were to come out public or go to the boss, you know, the wing commander or the squadron commander and said, Hey, I just chased a UFO. He said, yeah, you, you would, you'd have the, was that the green sticker that they put on poison? You know, poison mm -hmm. levels, the the yuck symbol. They stick it on your three hundred one, your two hundred one file from that point forward, and you're doomed. Your chances of you know, of promotion are, are slim and none. Mm 
That's so crazy. But in today's world, and they're starting to encourage them, and that's and that's where we're hoping that some military members, you know, even though they you know they do risk an awful lot, mm -hmm. uh, decide to go public, but not not to the mediocre level they've gone to so far. But I'm talking elevated uh, disclosure. Yeah, and well, as, we have more that, pilots coming out talking. So yeah, and that's and that's gonna that's gonna take someone of authority, someone with, with rank to come out and say, all right, now with the BS, I'm Brigadier General so-and-so, or I'm, you know, Colonel so-and-so. I have photographic evidence and here it is. I flew in formation with a Tic Tac. I flew in formation with you know, a TR-3B or this or that or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, hopefully it's getting to the point where that could happen. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, I know Amy can't stay too long, so. And our our one hour program our one hour program has never lasted an hour. Never. No. <laughs> I thought it was a two hour program. No, it, it, initially it was a one hour program, but but, it's, but it, it hasn't been two hour, which is great. It hasn't been since the since its inception with me on on board. So, I'm I'm pleased to be here, and and I and I again this. We are we are here because we're supposed to be here, hmm. the three of us and everybody that comes on and yep. uh, and I'm just I'm just hoping that there, there there's something happens before I leave the planet. Uh, Amy, I'm 77. I'm 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 blessed. I'm, I'm in. Six. Pardon. I'm 36. Oh, I'm okay. Just old. I'm 46. I'm so I got I got, I got 41. <laughs> I got 41 years on you. Yeah, and. I hope before I leave this planet that something's something's going to happen. And I, somewhere in my gut, it, it keeps gnawing at me, said, well, you're going to be around when it does happen. And I know I'm going to live to be at least a hundred. You know, most of the males on my mom's side of the family lived to be hundred from 103 to 107. These are all Sicilian. They didn't have good medical care back then. Everybody, everything was, yeah, third phase. Yep, I like those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, they like Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Well, I, well, I do too. I Amy's like Lynn. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I like Jim. You know, I, I love and Lynn. again, I love Jim. I there's, love there, there, there's, We're there's, all there's, there's, there's so many, there's so many in this community that I feel so comfortable with. Hmm. And this, and I, and I have, I've told the cousin president, I've told Michael, and I think I've told you that Lynn that mm -hmm. this is the. I'm not a joiner of groups. I don't, uh, other than military and Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. But every volunteer job I do, you know, after a while, you know, this these are not these are not my people. I guess, if that's the best way to, to place it, or I don't I don't have a, a, a high level of comfort, or they don't share the same interests, or that you know, politically or militarily or whatever, and it in. And I've always, and I'm, I'm almost always been a loner. I have no friends in Tucson. I, I have a lot of, number of acquaintances, but everybody I hang with, John's on the road a lot. Uh, and again, now that John's close, you know, we, he's been over here a couple of times, and I've been over there a uh, number of times. But he's he's busy. I've been retired for ten years. You know, I, I I still I run out of time because I'm doing so damn many things. But it, the the majority of everybody in this in this community and that's the best way i can say it. it's a, it's a community of crazy people people with bizarre ideas people that are really and some of them are really really far out mm. it's the best but, but it is no it it it, it these are i'm te i'm dealing with real people yeah and real personalities i'm not dealing with some asshole who who's trying to impress himself not not me but himself seeing how great he is you know, for me, I'm just a guy who likes airplanes. I like machines, planes, trains, and automobiles. I like fast cars, fast airplanes, fast women. Well, it's a that's I was a, just going to say, it's a past. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was in my youth. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. Why? Am, why am I so washed out? I just. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, excuse me. I'm just messing with the lights. I just can never seem to get them right. You know, what the hell? Um, no, I just, I enjoy it. 
I really do. I look forward to Mondays. Not that many people who work for a living, I don't work for a living anymore, can say, hey, I like Mondays. And the reason I like Mondays, I'm on with Lynn. And we have we have wonder, wonderful guests on board. Um, and it's just uh, it's just fun. And I, and Amy, I promise you, you, know, you you get the information through Lynn to me, so we, so it's yep. not up so the world to see it. And I hate to have yeah, someone. And Sounds I, good, I have, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna be in Albuquerque. I have to go see Stu. So uh, he has a friend that is a retired either Apache or Navajo Supreme Court Justice. Ooh, that's cool. And he was he was brought on for two years at the Dulce Pueblo. He knows everybody. And he speaks the, the same native tongue that the locals do. So there are people, you know, some of the elders who have never left the Pueblo. Mm -hmm, so that's door, correct. Doors, and he's, he's, ta he's talked to a couple of the key people. He's asked, would, would you be okay if I brought someone in and I'll be the interpreter and they ask you questions about the past? And he said, that could be really earth shattering. Mm. So that's, you know, that's one of the reasons I, I have to get up there. And, and, you know, we've had such, you know, such rotten weather. And of course, uh, you know, the scandemic screwed up everything as far as travel and, and whatever. So, uh, William William said he'd be he would love to to come up with us. I said you can see the Dulce military facility from Indian land, and there's nothing the federal government about it. Ooh, my gosh, that would be yes. amazing. And uh, I thank you for the compliment. I really appreciate the message down below. Yeah. Oh yes, we uh, love Chris too. She's awesome. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm hoping I say when, next time I come back, you know, we're we're going to end up at Dulce. But when I'm in town, I want to I, I definitely want to sit down and uh, share a cup of coffee, a, a joint, yes, or whatever. Yes, I'm into with, it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah. yeah. Now we're well, I'm a 77 year old pothead. I can't help it. I don't yeah. drink and I don't smoke. <laughs> I don't choose. Six year old pothead. <laughs> yeah. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, even if even if you've been smoking weed your whole life, this is how you turn out. You know, white hair. <laughs> that's not so bad then, right? That's so that's how you liver, turn out. liver liver spots. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh teeth that teeth that belong to somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So it's it's all fun. It's all fun. Oh, you guys all have fun. Oh, we do. We do. And uh, that's about does it, I think. Yeah, I, I think, think so. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for joining us. That was Amy. Let me come, guys. This has been it, so it, much fun. It, it, it was an absolute delight, and I look forward to uh, sitting down and chatting with you face to face. Yes, Amy. Me too. And I got to do that with Lynn too. And I may be, I may be going out to the East Coast. Awesome. Um, I'm here for it. Uh, Dr. Greer has indicated that he wants to sit down with me, and it may be I'll be back. back Meet you, Dr. To do Greer's. It. I'll be there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and sure. I, you know, on his, you on, his on on the on the you know uh, disclosure, the, the one, the second one, uh, above mm -hmm. top secret, now end game. They, these are all Dr. Greer stuff, but I'm in all three of them, and it's just sort of that sort of happened. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what would be, you know, David? What would be awesome? It's my warmongering husband meeting. I you. know, I know that. Oh, that I, that would be. I would be in the Boston area. That's that's what he's probably referring to. Yes, yeah, yeah. warmongering. Yes. Yeah, no, I would, I would love it. I would just really, really enjoy it. And I'm a history buff, and I've, you know, I've been to all the sites, and I, um, I've been, I've seen Plymouth Rock. There's it's not much to it anymore. It's about no, the no, yeah, but the. The fun, the most fun thing I ever had in the Boston area, I had a dance partner, you know, I think she's dead now, but uh, named Connie. And she said, can you come here on a weekend? I said, why is that? She says, there's a tea dance in Cape Cod on Sundays. So we drove all the way out to the tip of Cape Cod. There's a, there was a party going on and Connie and I were the only heterosexual couple in the place. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting my ass pinched by guys. I was getting dirty looked by women. 
<laughs> they were they were having drag races. I mean, they were in drag racing, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, but then it took two and a half hours to get away getting from Cape Cod back into Boston because mm -hmm. it was just bumper to bumper. Yeah. But it's crazy. But I do love Boston. I I, I love the North End. There's a, there's a place I need to go eat. I want to go to uh, Villa Francesca. It's on Hanover Street. Hopefully they're still there. It's been oh a long, my gosh, long time. I'll totally go to the North End with you. Yeah, so good. that would be great. That would be great. And the first time I went to Boston, my boss, I was working for a company out of Andover, Mass. It's called mm -hmm. uh, it's called Mo yeah, Modicon. Yes, yeah, it was called Modicon. They were an old, old uh, uh, I don't know, make sales or whatever at one time. Big, huge building. And he said, well, uh, says, I'm going to show you parts of Boston that you don't see in the regular travel uh, brochures. He took me to the combat zone. Oh, God. Yeah. And walking, he said, any woman you see walking the street, whether she looks like your mother or your grandmother or your, your little sister, she's a hooker. We walk in here. Everybody knew this guy. I mean, he was the human resources director for the company I was working for. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he said, she's an attorney. She's an elementary school teacher. She's a doctor. I mean, they do it because whatever. I mean, uh, it was it was real interesting. I think that's that was been torn down years ago or decades ago now. But it was mm -hmm. it was it was a fascinating area, and it's just when you look. I mean, there was I saw I saw someone look just like my granny, my little old Sicilian granny, and she was a hooker too. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. you know, she was still she was making it work. Yep. Yeah. Someone for everyone. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, all righty. It's been one hour, correction, two hours and 12 minutes that we've been burning the airways up. And I, uh, I'm going to have to uh, go spend some time with the boss. Yes. And uh, since I've been gone for a week. For, for us. Oh, yeah, I will. It's just, uh, she's just my, my sweetie dog. She's so good. Oh, oh yeah, she's she's sixty pounds of the most loving dog in the, that I've ever had, and I've had German Shepherds before. Um, and Rosemary, who's my wife, she 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 said, "Well, you can't love a dog." Well, that changed almost instantly after we got Scarlet. Yeah, yeah. she just absolutely loves her. So, with that, uh, to everybody who's been on board with us tonight, I want to mm -hmm. I want to thank you for uh, your joining us. I want to thank Amy, Alien Girl 111, and of course, the always lovely Lynn Hurley. Thank you, Lynn. For, uh, I, I love spending my, my Monday evenings on rebellious ufology. It's just, it's just fun. I enjoy I'm so it. happy you're here with me. Yeah. And uh, Amy, I look forward to seeing you once again next time I'm in Can Albuquerque. Yes, which will be excited. soon. Which will be soon. Yes, sweet. And uh, we'll just we'll just take it to the next level. Sounds good. Sounds and good until man. and and until next week, I have to go. <laughs> and you all have a wonderful evening and what's left of it. And uh, well, watch things that go bump in the night. Keep looking in the sky. And I know so many people that never look up. When I go outside, I'm always looking for something that I can't explain. And, mm -hmm. and, I've, and unfortunately, there isn't anything I've ever seen that I couldn't explain. <laughs> so, <No. laughs> but, I, but I'm still a believer in, in UFOs. So it's like Ditto. You, you believe in gravity, but you can't see it. Right? That's true. So, I believe in a million dollars, but I've never seen it. I have. Huh. I saw I saw it. I was at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C. I think it was a tour, and you're up above. You're looking down on everything. And there were 11 pallets of $100 bills. Oh, my God. Now, each, each page is 32 bills, hmm. and there are 10,000 of them per pallet. Oh, my gosh. And they had 11 pallets. What? That's crazy. They hadn't been serialized or cut yet. And they were ready to go through the machines to you know, to get them cut. Wow. So yeah, I have seen a million dollars. <laughs> wow, that's great. Oh, if you go to Vegas, you, depending on the, on the casino, they have they have exhibits of a lot of money, and they said it's a million dollars. So very cool. 
Yep. You give it to me. I'll, I'll put it to good. I get put it to good yeah. use. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go. All right. You all have a, you all have a wonderful evening. And again, again, Amy, it was an absolute delight chatting with you. And yes, it was it always, awesome. It, it always is with Lynn. Thank and, you. And you as oh well. My gosh, I've turned into a ghost. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. I got to go. All right. Take care. Good Enjoy. Night, All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.